I want to talk about Archie Cochrane's most important clinical trial. He was a prisoner of war in a prison camp uh, near Salonika in, in the Second World War. And he and many of the other prisoners were suffering from a condition that he couldn't really diagnose. He didn't understand what was causing it. He didn't know whether it was going to be fatal. Uh, he didn't know what was going to cure it. And he was trying to solve this problem in an extremely hostile environment. On one occasion, one of the camp guards threw a grenade into the prisoner's lavatory because he said he heard suspicious laughter. I think when we're trying to solve problems in a very complicated world, it's very easy to fall into one of two traps. So one is um, what I think a lot of normal people do, which is to say, it's really hard. Uh, what can I do? And just give up. The second approach, which I think is quite common amongst movers and shakers, it's common amongst senior doctors, it's common amongst politicians, it's common amongst chief executives, uh, you know, all, all these kinds of psychopaths, um, <laughs> is, uh, is what Archie Cochran called the God complex, where you basically say, well, you might think the problem is complicated, but it is as nothing compared with my mental powers. I know what the solution is, and uh, I don't need a second opinion, I don't need evidence, away I go. Perhaps having in mind James Lynn's famous clinical trial of vitamin C, uh, he thought, well, I could give some of the prisoners vitamin C. He had vitamin C. How did he have vitamin C in a prison camp? Uh, he'd smuggled it in, of course. He also managed, uh, this was rather brilliant, to get hold of supplies of marmite, a valuable source of vitamin B12. So he's got vitamin B12 and he's got vitamin C. And he's got a bunch of people who are really sick, including him. He divides them up as best he can, and he starts administering the two vitamins to the two groups. Whatever the cause of the illness is, the cure is Marmite, vitamin B12. He then goes to the, doc, the, the prison camp guards. Now you've got to imagine now, forget this photo, imagine this guy with a Billy Connolly beard. Okay, so he's Scottish, he speaks fluent German, and he looks like a tramp. And he's ranting at these Germans about how this is the culture that gave Goethe to the world and Schiller to the world, and he can't believe that it's fallen into such barbarism, and they have to supply vitamins for the prisoners, and uh, so and so and so on. And he guesses he's not really getting anywhere, and he goes <coughs> back to his quarters, and he breaks down and weeps. But a young German doctor picks up Archie Cochrane's notebook, looks at these beautiful, meticulous graphs, and says to his colleagues, gentlemen, this evidence is incontrovertible. If we don't supply vitamins to the prisoners, we're committing a war crime. And very soon, supplies of vitamin B12 turn up at the camp and the prisoners start to recover. And one of the things that strikes me is the world is only getting more complicated, and yet our recognition of that complexity is, is often very limited. And that's the reason why I think bearing... Archie Cochrane's methods in mind is so important. The idea of saying, look, if you're not happy with how something in the economy works, you want to reform a major organisation, you want to change the course of a war, you want to do something about climate change, you want to fix the banks, or maybe your aims are a little bit more modest, you just want to make your organisation work better, you want to launch a new product, you want to <laughs> deliver a service better. You are interfering, to, to paraphrase John Maynard Keynes, you are interfering in the workings of a delicate machine, the operation of which you don't understand. Which makes everything sound like a, a council of despair. Makes it seem like there's basically nothing you can do, it's too complex, forget it. Um, actually, that's not the way uh, I see things. I see successful systems all the time, all around me. You can do this in an industrial context. Uh, Unilever once did this. There's a lovely story told by the geneticist uh, Steve Jones about how Unilever learned to make um, better detergent powder, soap powder. So the way you do this, it turns out, is you have a huge vat of liquid detergent and you spray the liquid detergent through a little nozzle. So it turns out that the design of the nozzle is important. It's really important. So how do you get a better nozzle? The obvious way to do this is well, to find some expert who understands this problem and get him or her to design you a better nozzle. That's what Unilever did. It was a complete failure. It didn't work at all. It turns out even this problem, which doesn't seem that hard, it's too hard for us. And then some bright spark at Unilever said, well, why don't we just um, you know, make like Archie Cochran and just start trying stuff out? 
So they took a nozzle and they just made some small alterations to it. So the 10 variants. So a slightly shorter version, a slightly longer version, thinner version, a wrinklier version. And after about 20 generations, they had this nozzle looked a little bit like this um, chess piece and worked brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly. And I am assured that they have absolutely no idea how it works. <laughs> and the funny thing is, you know, they, they don't need to. You may be aware of the research of the psychologist Solomon Ash on conformity. He just had a bunch of young men uh, from Stanford sitting around a table, and he was asking them to do a, quite a simple task, which was, you've got three lines. Tell me which of three, these three lines, A, B, or C, is the same length as this line over here. And you go around the table, and the answer is obviously C, and the first person would say A, and the second person would say A and the third person would say A, and the fourth person would say A. And of course, you probably figured out the punchline. So the guy on the far end of the line is the candid star, right? He's the person being experimented on. Everybody else is an actor. And as you go around going A, 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 with the real answer C, you'd see signs of stress starting to break out in the people on the far end of the line. And in the end, very often, they would talk about how their eyes were deceiving them and so on, but in the end, they would often say A, same as everybody else. Um, what I think is less well known is that when Solomon Ash changed the procedure a little so that one of the other people would say C, the right answer, then even if it was only one person, even if everybody else said A, the person at the end of the line would be much more willing to say, yeah, it's C. More than that, even if the single dissenter didn't even give the wrong answer, he just gave a different answer, he said B, everyone's saying A, this guy says B, the real answer is C, that was enough to relieve this peer pressure, this pressure to conform, and people would be much more likely to, to say, OK, the answer is C. So very, very important to allow people to express different ideas, to try out different things, even if those things are themselves bad ideas. Merely the expression of difference, the expression of dissent, can be highly productive. So in a complicated world, no matter what you are doing, you're trying to change an organisation, you're trying to make a new policy, you're going to get things wrong. Therefore, dissent and criticism is very important for getting feedback, finding out whether something's working or not. I probably have to show you Ben Goldacre's slide, people who tolerate the NHS bill, people who are invited to the emergency summit, people who call for the bill to be dropped, people who are not invited to the summit. I'm not an expert on healthcare reform. There's probably more to it than that. but um, <laughs> Or maybe not. I don't know. But um, anyway, just, you know, if that's what, meets the, that's what meets the eye and it doesn't look great, dissent is really important. Point number two, careful measurement of results. You have to have this sense of what success might look like. And you have to have a mechanism for figuring out whether you're getting there or not. And very important, a willingness to try several things to change direction if they're not working. On point two and point three, the most successful and influential social scientist in the country, Jamie Oliver, he'd basically created not a perfect randomised trial, but a natural experiment. He got all the schools in Greenwich to change their menu. Jamie Oliver had mobilised resources, he had taught the dinner ladies and so on, just let them get on with it. So these two economists came along and just measured the results. And it turns out, well, oh, kids do better at maths. Kids do better at reading. Kids are away from school less often. Uh, Tony Blair and David Cameron, who were party leaders at the time, were falling over themselves to say what an amazing thing it was that Jamie Oliver had done. It's made me a little bit sad because Tony Blair had been running the country for eight years. <laughs> uh, it's not, I mean, it's not even that surprising. I mean, we kind of know that you know, nutrition may be connected to behaviour. It's not a terribly surprising result. No one had bothered to try, and no one had bothered to measure the results. It took a celebrity chef to run this experiment. Final thought from a Japanese mathematician. Um, this guy, uh, Yutaka Taniyama, with his friend Goro Shimura, uh, just after the Second World War, developed this amazing mathsy thing. It was called the uh, Taniyama Shimura Conjecture. Huge edifices of mathematics were built on top of the Taniyama Shimura conjecture. And it became apparent that if you could prove it, you would also prove Fermat's last theorem. It just sort of drops out as a corollary. Uh, but they could never prove it. And in 1952, shortly before his 30th birthday, uh, Yutaka Taniyama killed himself. Many decades later, Fermat's last theorem was proved. And it was proved because the Taniyama Shimura conjecture was proved. And somebody tracked down Goro Shimura. It sat, sat him in front of a TV camera. 
who's a professor at Princeton, turned out. He said, what was he like? What was your friend li like? Yutika Taniyama. I never forget what he said. He said, he was not a very careful person as a mathematician. He made a lot of mistakes. But he made mistakes in a good direction. I tried to copy him, but I realized it's very difficult to make good mistakes. Very happy to take questions, but thank you all for listening.